Romanesque art, 11th and 12th century. Romanesque is a name that was coined in the 19th century to describe the, art, the pre-Gothic art style of the 11th and 12th centuries. Now, it was named Romanesque simply because it reminded people of uh, Roman architecture. Uh, because it had stone vaults, rounded arches, very massive architecture. But it really is not Roman. It is not classical architecture. It is not uh, antique Roman uh, architecture. So don't be fooled by the name. They do not, the uh, Masons do not use concrete rubble construction. They don't use concrete, I think, until the 19th century. Uh, Romans used it and then modern era. Uh, they do not use the classical architectural orders of Doric, Ionic, uh, Corinthian composite. Uh, the sculpture is usually very abstract. Uh, you may have tubular figures, you know, tubular arms and legs, and uh, the proportions can be stretched any which way just to fit uh, the space available in the architecture. Uh, so you essentially have very uh, non-illusionistic or very non-classical uh, sense of the figure and of uh, decorating uh, your your buildings. Uh, there are a few exceptions, uh, but generally you'll find more abstract art. Uh, something that's almost the opposite of uh, the classical illusionist. One of the characteristics of Romanesque art is that there are regional styles or regional characteristics. And this is because there are regional rulers. We don't have uh, the Carolingian emperor, emperors uh, ruling vast tracts of territory. Um, certainly we had the Autonian emperors. The last Autonian uh, emperor died in uh, 1024. Uh, and another dynasty uh, inherited the throne of the uh, king of the Germans, and they l eventually take on the title of Holy Roman Emperor. Um, but even that, that's fairly restricted. It's pretty much Germany and some of Italy, and uh, parts of it break up too. Uh, and even in areas that have a, a king, uh, you also have a lot of other rulers. You have barons or dukes or margraves or you know, whatever the titles are, uh, who are working using, who are ruling their principalities, even though they answer uh, to uh, sometimes answer to a king, um, they actually are very jealous of their authority and don't want to be told what to do. Uh, after the disintegration of the Carolingian Empire, individual principalities were the norm. Only rarely, for example, the Ottonian Empire were large parts of Europe ruled by a single monarch. The economic system was feudalism based on a hierarchical class system of lords, or these powerful maybe kings, dukes, barons, whatever, uh, and uh, vassals, who are other lords, uh, owe fealty or loyalty uh, to these lords. Now, basically, the idea is you give me something and I'll give you something. You give me land and I'll send warriors uh, when you need somebody to fight. Um, the warrior class owns the land. And the warrior class rules and fights. <laughs> they do that a lot. Uh, who does the work? The serfs. The serfs are the peasants. They work the land. Uh, they do the manual labor. Technically, they are not slaves because they can't be sold away from the land, but they really have uh, no rights. So uh, they have uh, very, very poor conditions of living. Now, the idea was that God had established a hierarchy in heaven, and there was also a hierarchy on earth. And they had the idea that heaven, uh, the idea of hierarchy was very important in the Middle Ages. Uh, heaven was a celestial hierarchy with God at the apex, different orders of angels below, finally men, who are a little lower than the angels. Uh, 
church is another hierarchy. In the West, uh, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, had uh, finally gained the authority as the preeminent head of the Western Latin Church. Uh, and conflict during the Romanesque period, there was a great conflict between kings and popes, or the emperor and the popes. And uh, particularly, this was based on who is going to pick candidates or who is going to name uh, the bishops or name the people to ecclesiastical or church offices. Uh, tr traditionally, the rulers had named the bishops. Uh, the emperor had named the pope. And during the 11th century, that begins to change. Uh, there is a huge controversy called the investiture controversy. Who can invest bishops? And uh, sometimes the emperors are appointing popes and the cardinals are appointing popes. This is when the College of Cardinals grows up as well. They have to have somebody who will elect the pope. Um, I don't think we'll be doing too much discussion of that in this class, but I'm just that's a little background for you. Uh, so conflict arose between the king or the emperor and the pope as to whose authority should hold sway, both claiming to be divinely appointed for their office, uh, both claiming that they are the regents or the vicar of God on earth. Now, monasticism is very important. This is the period of the growth of monastic orders. Uh, you know, the Carolingians, uh, Charlemagne, Louis the Pious founded many monasteries. They're growing. There's others being founded. Uh, you're even having uh, new monastic orders coming into being, although I think even more perhaps in the Gothic period. Um, and they're founding monasteries, there's building campaigns to expand existing ones uh, and to found new ones. Uh, generally, when we think of Romanesque churches, most of those Romanesque churches uh, seem to be abbey or monastery churches. Okay. Monasticism is a powerful institution, or was a powerful institution. Uh, essentially, it's a community of people who have taken religious vows, and these vows are poverty, chastity, obedience. They live in common. Uh, they don't own individual property, although later on that breaks up a bit. You, know, you might have your own prayer book or your own uh, uh, rosary. And of course, the rosaries come in much later, but you know your own uh, little cross or something like that. But you're not supposed to at first, anyway. Um, in the West, uh, most of the monks are following the rule of St. Benedict and the liturgy of the eight canonical hours, or the divine office. Uh, what that means is that eight times during the day and night, uh, the monks and the nuns stop what they're doing, or if they're asleep, get out of bed and go to the church, and they have a, a, essentially a short service. Uh, where they recite the divine office, which are prayers, uh, responsive readings, uh, psalms. Uh, during one of them, of course, there would be a mass said every day. Uh, but not everyone is not a complete uh, hour-long service that we think of today in, in many of our churches. Um, they, they take place about every three hours, essentially. Uh, some of the names are still with us. Vesper services. Lots of churches have Vesper services. Those are sunset services. Uh, now, uh, the monks are, have, are supposed to <laughs> devote their lives to work and prayer in obedience to their vows. Obedience to the rule of the order and obedience to their superiors in the church. And their direct superior, of course, would be the prior or the abbot. Uh, who rules the monastery. Uh, and then, of course, you would have uh, higher-up people in the church, too. Um, Top-ranking monks did not always stay in the, the cloister. They didn't always stay in the monastery. Uh, they had a lot of contact with the out outside world. Uh, some of these abbots were advisors to kings and uh, um, 
In fact, sometimes they started out as, well, think of Bishop Bernvard in the Ottonian period. Uh, he was the tutor to Otto III, and then he was appointed bishop. Um, you can't have it the other way around, too, uh, uh, where the bishop can become the advisor, or the abbot can become an advisor. Um, monasteries can serve as pilgrimage sites if they have very important relics. And uh, they, many of them have guest houses. And these essentially are the inns where people would stay when they're traveling. Uh, some of them have schools, uh, to first to train the novices, and then eventually um, some of the uh, nobility uh, would send their sons and daughters uh, to be taught in monastic schools, or convent schools in the case of the girls. Um, we mentioned before the, in, or the infirmaries. Uh, you start having an infirmary for the monks, and as uh, a town grows up around it, uh, people might even uh, come and uh, ask for help when they, they needed it. So uh, some of these things serve the secular world as well as the religious communities. Now, essentially, most monasteries start out uh, being uh, away from other people, sort of in a remote location, going into the wilderness to separate themselves from the world. Uh, but as it would happen in many cases, uh, the world follows them. Uh, towns grow up around monasteries. And you'll find some that are still out in the uh, uh, remote locations, but others become uh, a, a town or a city. And uh, in those cases, obviously, they're going to have more interaction with the locals. Uh, donations of land and serfs plus other gifts caused many of the monasteries to become self-sufficient, which all monasteries are supposed to be self-sufficient. Remember that from the plan of St. Gall, the idea that you, uh, your monks and uh, their serfs and uh, the lay brothers are supposed to be able to raise everything you need. So you have an ideal of a self-sufficient monastery. I don't know if they always were. Probably not. But as uh, more people would donate land to the monasteries, uh, and when you donate land, you're donating the serfs to work it with you. Uh, you know, they come. They come too. Um, other gifts are given to the monasteries. So some of these monasteries become extremely wealthy. Now, how does that tie in with your vows of poverty? Well, the vow of poverty is against individual ownership. So the individual monks don't own the land, but the, com the community, the monastery, owns it. But they do not have individual ownership. As a practical matter, uh, they enjoyed the fr fruits of it, and the abbots particularly uh, administered this. Uh, and of course, some monasteries were able to uh, uh, be charitable to the poor of their community, uh, the outside the secular world, others perhaps not. Um, nuns took similar vows, but were much more strictly cloistered. They were not supposed to be wandering around. Um, often the female orders were poorer. People would rather donate to a male order. Uh, and they were, as we said, more strictly cloistered. Uh, some of the poorest ones were completely dependent on donations for the very food they ate, and sometimes they went hungry. Um, but other times, of course, uh, let's say you're a wealthy, you know, a, a wealthy landowning family, and you send your youngest daughter off to be a nun in the uh, monastery. Well. You know, you may very well want to provide a greater. You may want to provide a, a greater donation than simply the dowry. And nuns did have dowries, just as you are getting married to somebody, uh, to a secular lord. Uh, you are the bride of Christ. You have to bring a dowry. Um, so. Um, you know, not everybody was, was bad off or very wealthy. There's a whole range. Uh, and at different times also, a, a monastery might start poor and become la wealthy later. Uh, both male and female convents had scriptorium. 
uh, in which manuscripts were copied and both male and female religious might illuminate manuscripts, which we've already seen. starts in the 11th century. Right at the beginning of the 11th century is when we saw uh, Romanesque art. We see Romanesque art beginning. And that is uh, the year 1000, the year of the millennium. Now, many just remember right before the year 2000, there were people who were saying the end of the world is coming, it's going to happen in the year 2000. Well, even more so in the year 1000. Um, People really believed that the end of the world would soon occur, um, that uh, the apocalypse was upon them, that the last judgment would come, and the year passed, and the world was still there. And uh, I have a quotation here uh, from Raul Glauber, who was a Cluniac monk, and he's writing about uh, 1003. And he says, Therefore, after the year of the millennium, which is now about three years past, there occurred throughout the world, especially in Italy and Gaul, a rebuilding of church basilicas. It was as if the whole earth, having cast off the old by shaking itself, were clothing itself everywhere in the white robe of the church. And so uh, we think that yeah, they were so happy that the world didn't end that they start building churches uh, in thanks to God. Some of the characteristics that we see in Romanesque churches uh, are mason revolts uh, with rounded arches. There are a few exceptions, but uh, by and large, most of them have mason revolts, rounded arches, uh, tunnel or barrel vaults, groin or cross vaults, okay, either one, uh, rounded arches, and once again, uh, sometimes there are some exceptions in Burgundy, they start doing pointed arches, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, so most of these churches have rounded arches. Uh, they have very thick masonry walls, often with very small windows. Uh, and there is what we call the articulation of parts. Or you could also think of it as kind of a visual separation of parts. When you articulate something, you say it very clearly and distinctly. Uh, when you can see uh, these distinct parts, uh, we call it an articulation of parts. And we'll see that as we look at these. Uh, we said the walls are often very, very thick to support those heavy masonry vaults. And here you're seeing some diagrams. If you look at uh, the first two uh, examples, you've seen rounded arches, uh, what we call a tunnel vault. A tunnel vault is simply uh, if you take a round arch and you would extend it, you'd make it longer, uh, you have a tunnel vault uh, or a barrel vault. It looks like a barrel. And uh, you could have one that's just simply uh, does not have anything going across it. But very frequently, you see in the uh, center example here, St. Serenin in Toulouse, uh, you have transverse arches or uh, arches that go across the ceiling, across the vault. We'll show you some of those. Uh, something else you occasionally have, usually in the side aisles, but sometimes they do experiment with it, as in uh, uh, Santa Madeleine in uh, Vesale. They do experiment with it in the nave, uh, is a groin or a cross vault. And here we're going to see some diagrams. Uh, if you look down to the diagram where it says A, B, C, the first one is your barrel vault or your tunnel vault, and B and C are the groin vault or the cross vault. And what they are is you took a barrel vault and you crossed it at right angles, uh, you have a groin vault. And so you can see B is as if you were looking down at it, you were in the ceiling or someplace, um, and C is as if you're looking up. So they look like sort of concave triangles. The diagram with the arrows on it is showing you, they're saying, the thrust or the way the weight is distributed in a uh, rounded arch or rounded vault, a tunnel vault. And you can see that the vault itself, uh, the front, the arch, is made up of these wedge-shaped 
blocks. The one in the middle is called a keystone, and the others are called either archivolts or voussoirs. Uh, but essentially, because they're wedge-shaped, they kind of lean on each other and sort of uh, distribute the weight uh, to each other. And then, as you go out, you see these arrows going out. Um, the thrust, or the weight, is going out. And you need to have very, very thick walls to support this. If your walls are too thin, the whole thing will collapse. Uh, so uh, you need to have very thick walls. Sometimes they'll even add, as we'll see, buttresses. Um, the other drawing here is showing you the method of construction. So you're going to put up one of these groin vaults. Uh, you use a method called centering, which essentially is a wooden framework is made. The masonry is placed over it. Uh, and then when that dries, uh, they can take the wood, the wooden framework down and move it to the next section or the next bay. Uh, and you can also see that they're building a, a roof, a gabled roof, above this vaulting. So it's kind of like if you have an attic area above your ceiling. Here you're looking at a cross section. Now, every Romanesque church does not have the same cross section or the same uh, elevation. We'll see variations. But this serves as a good generic example. Um, so you've got your mason revolt. Why? Why go to all that trouble? Why go to all that work? Well, there's, of course, different reasons. One of the reasons we think is probably fire safety. Wooden roof in a building where you have candles burning all the time is a fire hazard. So uh, it takes a lot more to burn stone uh, and crack, of course, in high heats. And you do have churches that burn down. Uh, but uh, it's less likely to burn down if you have a mason revolt than if you have a timber or wooden ceiling. So that's one possibility, fire safety. The other is the acoustics. This is the period of the Gregorian chant. Uh, a plain song, uh, a chant that is unaccompanied by musical instruments. And uh, the monks are chanting, and the sound is reverberating off the mason revolt. Another reason is probably it, it looked good. They probably developed it. Uh, you know, these masons came up with a new idea, something they thought would be really good. Um, and they continued to do it, and they continued to experiment with it, and they continued to develop it, uh, because people found it pleasing. Now, here we're looking at a kind of cross-section, and we're also looking into the nave, so you can uh, have, see this kind of cutaway view. Um, and we're talking again about that articulation or separation of parts. If you look at uh, the diagram and you look into the nave, you can see that there's a colonnette or a shaft that rises uh, from the floor, goes up to the springing of the vault, and then you have a transverse arch that crosses over and comes down the other side. And when you look at the wall, it looks like there's a vertical uh, shaft that's dividing the wall into sections. And you've already seen, and you can imagine, we'll see some more examples, if you look at the ceiling, uh, you're going to see these transverse arches going across, and they're going to divide up the ceiling. So essentially, we're starting to have sections of the church, which we call bays. Um, Know, clearly articulated, clearly separated. Uh, you can also see some horizontal sections. You can see that there's a horizontal molding uh, that's going across, that dividing the uh, nave arcade on the floor from the second story, or the gallery level. Uh, a gallery essentially is a second story, and it's large enough that people can walk around and you know, stand up there. Uh, the walls, to support that heavy vault, have to be very thick. And if you look at the outside of this, uh, this uh, building, uh, you can see that there are pilasters uh, or buttresses. Now they're, we call them buttresses. They're really thicker than pilasters. And uh, they help support the, uh, the building. And sometimes the buttresses can be quite thick. Uh, they also, here, are giving some visual interest to the uh, exterior. Uh, and uh, you know, projecting outward, dividing it up into sections, giving some vertical elements. 
I wanted to tell you what a Lombard Corbel table was. Uh, you'll probably hear the term or read the term. And basically, if you look at this diagram, you look at the drawing, you see at the top a series of arches, which are underneath a cornice or a molding. And their, decora their decoration, uh, they add a little thickness to the wall there, but primarily they're decorative. And that's what they call a Lombard Corbel table. Uh, one of the other characteristics that we find in this first Romanesque, these very early Romanesque churches, is that uh, the masons are often using fairly small split stones rather than giant blocks. You'll get great blocks later. You know, you'll get all sorts of masonry types. Uh, but here, uh, for the first examples, you're going to see some of the smaller stones. So now you know what a, a Lombard Corbel table.